Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you, sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to do a little intro before we get into Luke 2, and then we're going to walk through Luke 2, and my whole goal for the study today is to give you things that you have not heard in the Christmas story, but that is very true. And that's always hard to do when you have a passage this familiar. So I've been reading in things called Targums, which are really goofy. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Do a lot of Targums and Mishnas, and it's been fun. And I've got some really cool things that I think those of you who like to study the Bible are going to really like. And those that don't study the Bible, I'm hoping I'll whet your appetite and you will not become a Sunday morning Christian that just comes to see what the pastor's got to say, but you will go home and get into the Word and you will study the Word for yourself and say, this is amazing, because it is. So that's what we're going to look at today. Now, before we get started, we should just do a little bit. Um, most of you have heard of the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire, before it was an empire, was the Roman Republic for centuries. It was the Republic of Rome. It was a republic, like, like we were a republic. They were a republic. And they had a senate, interestingly enough. And they had military leaders who would serve in leadership. And they had political leaders who would rise up and serve and all. And they had, they had it going on. Well, then a guy came on the scene because what happened is the Republic existed for quite a long period of time. It started to get kind of weird. They, they had divisions in the Republic and there were wars and there were things going on and all this. And a man rose to the forefront. His name was Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar started to take control. Well, he had a sister. And Julius Caesar's sister had this little grandson that grew up. They called him Octavian. Gaius Octavian. Octavian. Probably called him Guy for short, I don't know, but you would think. But at any rate, they, they, they had this guy named Octavian. And as Octavian grew up, you can imagine, he says, my grandma, my great uncle, Julius Caesar, you can imagine. But Octavian, as he grew up, he had that it factor. He was just one of those kids, you know, some of us have grandkids, our grandkids have that it factor, you know how that is. But he had it. So Julius Caesar takes him in, his great nephew, and starts to train him and raise him up. He not only raises him up, he goes, he's my heir. He's going to be the guy, Octavian, because this, look at this guy. He's got everything you look for in leadership. He's got it. So Julius Caesar continued to work with the Republic and, and started to do things in the Republic and people started to go, this guy's got some stuff. And he made a, a deadly mistake. You know the story of Julius Caesar. If you've ever read Shakespeare or just a history book, you know. He started to think that he was all it. And he says, I am this dictator, if you will. I am it. It's no longer Republic, it's me. Remember Oh, Brutus, you too, Brutus, remember? And there it is, Brute. Oh, that's perfect. That's exactly it. And he was assassinated. The Senate assassinated him. When that happened, three leaders came and rose to the forefront. Octavian, he was the heir. One of the generals, Mark Antony, not Mark Anthony, not the guy whose ship just sunk in Miami, not that one, but Mark Antony. And Mark Antony and Octavian. And then another dude, uh, uh, Lipidus, whatever. He's going he's gonna to die soon, so don't worry about him. But these three. And then he gets wiped out, and pretty soon it's Octavian and Mark Antony vying for power in this republic. And things are messed up at this point. There's tons of wars. There's tons of brutality. There's tons of destruction going on all over the place. And, and the immorality is at a... Uh, it's crazy, you know. It's out of control. 
without getting into all the details, because we're just not going to get into all the details, but there was one of the most famous battles of all time. In BC 31, a naval battle between the forces of Mark Antony and, the, of course, but this time, if you're into it, just look it up because it's interesting, intriguing reading. There's all the political intrigue going on. You know, Octavian trying to make things right with Mark Antony and all, and can't we just all be peaceful in this thing? He's, Here's my sister Octavia. Marry her. You would never attack your brother-in-law. You know, you know how they do that. So he's married to Octavia, Octavian's sister, and Mark Antony's got this wife. Well, then he does something that's not going to go well at all. He goes to Egypt and finds out about Cleopatra. Liz Taylor, you know the whole thing. And he sees that, and he goes, oh my goodness, this is amazing, this is amazing. And so he, he joins forces with Cleopatra, so now he's got Egypt in there. Some people say there was nothing going on there. Mm -hmm. And it was just a, it was just a matter of a, a political union and all, but they form this thing, Mark Antony, Cleopatra, and they get this naval thing, there's a blockade and all this stuff, and I bet you studied that stuff probably, but... It, did you ever say that, Devin? You probably did. Yeah, I bet you. But anyway, I should have you talking about this. This is pretty interesting stuff. But they're in there, and they have this major battle, and you can see how they, he, Octavian has a blockade, and Mark Anthony sends the, the, the lateral flanks trying to break it, and then he goes through the middle, and then, uh, then the Egyptian Navy goes. It's, it's just interesting. You would love it. It's fun. But bottom line is Mark Anthony gets kicked bad. This is known as the Battle of Actium. One of, the, one of the most famous naval battles of all time. And what happens is Mark Antony goes down at this point. Eventually, he and Cleopatra, licking their wounds, so to speak, go back to Egypt. And you know, there's a couple little skirmishes here and there, it doesn't matter. And then they commit suicide, and Octavian becomes the man. But Octavian has got some serious brains. He looks at what his great uncle did, Julius Caesar. I'm it. Half the people said, yeah, you are it. And the other half said, you're not it. I know it. You're not it. And as a result, it cost him his life. Octavian says, I'm not it. I'm here to serve you all. I'm here to bring the republic back. Guess what the Senate did? Guess what all the people did? You know what they did? They said, you're it. You're it. That's Octavian. Octavian, he brought peace. You hear the Pax Romana? Octavian brought the Pax Romana because he defeated all the enemies. And it was, for the first time in history, all of Rome along all, all the coastline of the Mediterranean was all under one entity, Rome. He brought peace. He brought political skill. I, I put them all P's just so we kind of remember you. I like to do that, you know. But he brought political skill. He didn't say, I'm all it. He says, you're it. I'm here to serve you. And they said, we love this guy. He's it. Amazing. He pumped up the economy, our prosperity. Because when he defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra, all of the Egyptian coffers were open to him. He took all the Egyptian wealth and he funded his military. The Pax Romana now had funding and the Roman Republic had what to eat, shall we say. And because of that, he was extremely popular. It went from his great uncle's rating 50-50 to 90-10 type of thing. It skyrocketed. Octavian, he is probably the most famous leader of Rome. We all know about Octavian. For hundreds of years, Rome had prided itself on being a republic. But Octavian said, we're no longer a republic. We are an empire. And the people say, yeah, we is, that's good. And then the Senate called a meeting and said, you know what, Octavian? We're not going to call you Octavian anymore. We're going to call you Caesar. And not just Caesar, we're going to call you Caesar the Exalted One. Caesar the Sacred. Caesar the August One, or Caesar Augustus. So as Octavian, we know him as Caesar Augustus. 
he was the first Roman emperor, he was the man. And that is what is key because, guys, at that time, the world was hungry for a savior. And here comes Caesar the Great One, Caesar Augustus. But as time goes on, they're going to see, you know, a political savior isn't the answer. In fact, the absence of war does not guarantee the presence of peace. It's been said at this time, the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, but he cannot give peace of heart, for which we all yearn more than ever, and more than we've ever yearned for outward peace. So at this time, when there's this outward peace, the inner peace is still missing, and people are realizing it. We've all been there. We've all been there. If I could just have that, my life would be great. If I could just have that, my life would be great. If I could just have him look at me, whoo if she would just sit by me, yes. If I could just have dinner with her, my life is complete. You know how it is. We just think if we can get that one thing. And then we realize, well, I got it, but I still have that emptiness here. That's the world as we get into Luke chapter 2. In fact, the Bible, and remember, the Bible records historical events. And we know the history is true because the Bible confirms it. I'm so sick and tired of people saying history confirms the Bible. No, the Bible confirms history. And here it is. And it says in chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Now we know who that is. That all the world should be registered. It's interesting. A decree goes out from this one man in Rome, which is like a long ways away in these days. A decree goes out to all the known world at that time. We're talking the empire, the Roman Empire now. This decree, decree goes out by one man, and people everywhere follow it just like that. Just like that. It says, this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. And we've talked about Quirinius before, the significance of the fact that he is recorded as having two different censuses. One in, in um, I think it was 8, if I remember right, 8 B.C. to 6 B.C., another one in 6 A.D., and we've got into all that history and past teachings. But this just puts a tag on which one it was. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one, to his own city. Think about this now. Caesar Augustus gives an order, and everyone goes to their own city to be counted. That's how you got registered in those days. You see, Caesar Augustus was ruling. He was the man. But we're going to see today, but God was in charge. And that's important for us to remember. God can and will use anyone that he places in authority to fulfill his will. Our responsibility is to come under the authority God has placed in our life. But we never put our faith in the authority. We put our faith in the God who placed that authority there. And that is so important, especially in these days. Our faith is in God. We are, um, it's not United Statesians, it's um, we are Amer Americans. I haven't heard it for so long, I forgot the word. I'm so tired of us thinking that we're either Republican, Democrat, or Independents. Shame on all of us. We are Americans, and above that, we're Christians. Yeah. We are Christians, and we're Americans. And we don't allow the enemy to divide us anymore. It's all done. It's all done. And if you're a Republican, God still loves you. <laughs> and if you're a Democrat, God still loves you. And if you're an Independent, God still loves you. I spent this last week really looking at the Scriptures, and I can find nowhere in the Scripture that says God is a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> I'm trying to find where he says God's an American. He's not even an American, guys. 
And yet we talk so much about everything but Jesus, you know. So here we are. In those days, this decree went out. Man, Caesar Augustus is really the leader of the known world, for real. But he's not in charge. God is. And things haven't changed. God's still in charge. God is in charge. Oh, that we had the zeal for God the way we have zeal for our political parties. Could you imagine what would happen if Christians stood up and said, I'm a Christian and took the same strong stance we take for our political parties. Could you imagine what would happen in this nation? Besides tremendous heart attacks all over the place. What, the Christians are standing up? What? <laughs> but could you imagine? Could you imagine? It'd be pretty sweet. Pretty stinking sweet. Well, it was into this world where there's all this stuff going on. There's peace, but it's enforced peace. You will do as I say, or we'll kill you. That's what was going on. That's what's going on right now, and this is the world that Jesus was born into. And that's what we'll be looking at as we walk through the text. So, that's what we got. I'm going to sit down. Is that okay? I feel good. I just want to sit down. That'd be great. Walter and David, Gil, let's slide that out. That's, there it goes. See ya. Thanks. Someone told me, I've been sitting down on Thursday nights, and he said, you know, you should sit down on Sunday mornings too because it just seems like it's more relaxed, it's more chill. And I said, you know, I used to sit, sit down quite a little bit, except for this thing. But he said, I said, you know, I used to sit down quite a little bit. I'll fix this here too. And, um, but I said, now that I'm older, when I do this history stuff, I need notes because I'm not going to memorize all that stuff. Forget it. I used to be able to. I could just read it and know it. Now I read it and read it and read it and write it and read it and memorize it and I still have to read it. But <laughs> we're done. So now we can just stay in the, the text. So now let's just get into the word. So everybody got, was registered. Everyone went to his own city. Then Joseph, now, also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, so Nazareth, Nazareth up in the Galilee, into Judea, to the city of David. Now, if you've been to Israel, this is not the city of David we see in Israel, in Jerusalem there, remember, it's south of the Temple Mount, not that city of David. This is, thank you, this is the city of David that um, is Bethlehem. It's the city where David was born. It's the city where Boaz lived. It's Bethlehem. And we're going to be looking at Bethlehem a little bit, but this is that little city that's about five miles south of Jerusalem. So he goes from Nazareth up in the Galilee down to Bethlehem. It's about 80 miles. So that's like going up to Taos almost. Not quite to Taos, but... Yeah, just fix it. Somewhere like Taos. So he's going on up, or going down into Bethlehem now. Why? Because he was of the house and lineage of David. That was where his roots were and we had to go to their roots. Now Mary would not have to go with him. But we're going to see that she does. And we can understand why Mary would go with him. We look at that whole situation. It's jacked up. They're living in Nazareth. Mary's this young girl, 12 or 13 years old. Joseph, older, They're betrothed, but they're not married. And all of a sudden, remember what Mary says, um, I'm pregnant. Guys, put yourself in Joseph's sandals right there. Excuse me? I'm pregnant, Joseph. How about Mary's friends? You're what? How about the parents? <laughs> This is not good. This is not a good time right now. And then Joseph has a dream, remember? <laughs> Had a dream. And he says, the Lord speaks to Joseph in a dream. And he says, Joseph, that's, uh, this is legit. Just marry her. Joseph goes, oh my goodness. So now they're living in Nazareth. And you can imagine Joseph's buddies. <laughs> You're going to believe that, Joseph, really? Can you imagine, parents, your daughter comes home, I'm pregnant. Who's a dad? God. 
Exactly. Exactly. No different. And they're going, oh man. So now Joseph, I've got to go. Here it is. I've got to go. I've got to go to Bethlehem. You want to come with? What do you think? Uh, yeah. We got wagging tongues. You ever been a victim of a wagging tongue? I never have been, but I heard people sometimes gossip about folk. And man, well, she was the object of that. Can you imagine? So down they go to Bethlehem, 80 mile trek. It goes on, it says, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Those words don't go well together in Judaism at this time. The betrothed wife who was with child. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. We don't know how long that was. Was she six months along when they took off? Were they five months along, four months along, eight months? We don't know. It doesn't say. We just know that while they were there, she brought forth her firstborn son. Her firstborn son, the oldest son. I've never been introduced by my parents as their oldest son. They always just call me their son. They don't say this is our oldest son. They don't call me their youngest son. Same as being their oldest, I guess. I'm their only son. You don't have an only child and say this is my oldest or youngest child. You don't do that. It's just, this is my child. This was her firstborn son. The Bible even gives the names of the brothers that followed. So she gives birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. It's interesting. In the original language, it shows that she actually did the wrapping of the child in swaddling clothes. Very uncommon. There is usually a midwife or someone there to help, and they were the ones who would wrap the child, cleanse the child, and, and all. So this shows that Mary is on her own, so to speak, down here. And she wraps her little baby in these swaddling clothes. Those of you that are native origin. Ken, I know you're in here. I saw you come this morning. And this church is not that big. There you are. There you are. Okay. Did you, did you guys wrap? Do you know, did, were your children wrapped on the board and all that? Yeah. That's very typical. Uh, the Native Americans still do it. They use a board now and wrap them to the board. In Jesus' day, they just wrapped them in these swaddling strips of clothing. And it was for posture and security. And even now, if you part of the uh, Growing Kids God way, God's Way or... Um, baby wise they tell you to swaddle the babies remember for security where you wrap them tightly in their blankets and they're all swaddled um, that's been going on for millennium that's just what it is it's and that's what happened here with Jesus she wrapped him in these cloth strips but I found it so interesting that when Jesus was laid in the tomb he was wrapped in cloth strips I just found that interesting I also found it interesting that as time has come on, you know, in America, we have our manger scenes. We all know what the, the nativity scene looks like. We, we know it's a, a wooden structure with straw. We, we've seen it. A little cross, a little manger that the baby's laying. We've seen that. And then we go to Israel and we go, wait a minute, what are you talking about now? What do you mean there's no trees here? To her? What, what, are you, what are you talking about? What do you mean it's stone manger? What do you mean it's just a rock carved out? What are you talking about? Well, there it is. There's Solomon's manger. We even see him, remember, up in the ghetto. There they are. That's a manger. That's a manger. You mean Jesus would put in a... Well, yeah, well, that's not what Macy's says. <laughs> you know, so now we've got to believe we're going to believe Macy's. We're going to believe, you know, what it is. Go look at it. There it is. And also... The catilama, the catilama, the inn, or the place for animals, or the place to rest and set aside for. With this manger, this feeding trough. And as we look in the fourth century, we see Constantine's mom, remember, a Christian woman, now having access 
to the Holy Land, goes down and starts building churches all over Israel. And she comes to Bethlehem and she starts to talk with people from Bethlehem and say, well, where was it that Jesus was said to have been born? And they said, well, everyone knows that's that cave right over there. It's very close to the actual time. It's, it's 250, 300, 300 years later. And it's just that cave right there. Now, was that the cave? Who knows? But that's where they typically had their animals fed or in these caves. So she builds a church over this cave in Bethlehem, calls it the Church of the Nativity, and makes this fancy mosaic, remember, of the three wise men on that mosaic. Years go by, and Muslim comes into the Holy Land. And as the Muslim leaders come in, they see these Christian churches all over the place, they destroy one after, they just destroy them all. She had built all these churches commemorating different things, they just, they're gone. They come to Bethlehem, another church, let's destroy it, they're getting ready to destroy the church, and they say, wait a minute, look at that mosaic, that's us up there. She had the men, wise men from the east and said, that's us. Let that church stand. It's still standing today. And because of that, many people believe this could be the actual cave where Jesus was. If it is, it isn't. Who knows? But what's interesting is it was in a cave. When we go to Jerusalem, we see the empty tomb. Not the empty tomb, an empty tomb. Right near Golgotha right there. We walk into this little cave, if you will, carved out of the rock. I found it so interesting that Jesus, God in the flesh, being born literally to die. For most religious leaders, when they die, that's the, that's the end of their ministry. For Jesus, when he died, that was the fulfillment and the start of his ministry. And this little baby, born to die, wrapped in swaddling clothes, the same type of linen that will be wrapped in his body 33 years later. Born in a cave, placed in a tomb. It's just an interesting beginning and end bookends as we look at this. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in that manger, because there was no room for them in the normal place, the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now this was so interesting to me as I look at these shepherds. Like I said, I started reading a bunch of Targums and I started reading the Mishnah quite a little bit. And it was, it was just intriguing to me. In the Mishnah it says that during this time in the years preceding this time, it was against the law. It was strictly forbidden to let sheep graze and be raised anywhere in Israel except in the wilderness, that area between Jerusalem and Jericho. If anybody ever seen uh, Oklahoma? Remember that movie, Oklahoma, or the, the play Oklahoma? Remember? Remember the, the cattlemen and the, the sheep folk? Can't be friends. Can't be friends. They even sang about it, remember? Because sheep do so much damage. They, they chew down so close to the ground that there's... Well, back in these days, the sheep got to be in the wilderness. Don't bring them in here grazing. And that's something. One exception, it says in the Mishnah, and that was the temple sheep. Sheep that are being raised for sacrifices and Passover, they could be raised elsewhere. Not in the wilderness. That is the basis when you hear, well, these shepherds could quite possibly be temple shepherds. I've heard that for years. I've taught it for years. I wanted to know why. That's why. Because of the Jewish forbearance, forbearance, that's not the right, forbidding, would not allow sheep to be grazed anywhere except in the wilderness, unless they're temple sheep. So the fact that there are sheep in Bethlehem, temple sheep. So these shepherds were taking care of temple sheep, it appears, or Passover sheep, it appears. But then I started reading these Targums, and the Targums are interesting because the Targums were commentaries written for people who could not read Hebrew, either because they were illiterate, and the Hebrew language was starting to go away a little bit, so they would comment on the Hebrew scriptures. But there's an interesting, interesting passage that I want us to turn to in Genesis chapter 35. And what the Targum says about Genesis 35 is it's pretty interesting. As you know, Jacob 
has a bunch of children now. He's got 11 of them. And his wife Rachel is pregnant with the 12th. And they're on, they're on the road. And it says in verse 16 of Genesis 35, Then they journeyed from Beth Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, also known as Bethlehem, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had a hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife, even back here they had a midwife, you see, that the midwife said to her, Don't fear, you're going to have this son also. <clears throat> and so it was, as her soul was departing, for Rachel dies in childbirth, that she called this little boy's name Ben-Ani, or son of my sorrow. But Jacob looks at this little guy and he says, no, no, we're not going to call him that. He says, we're going to call him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. So the son of the right hand born in Bethlehem. So Rachel died, was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel, or Jacob, journeyed and pitched his tent beyond, here's the key, the tower of Eder. And that's something we just read about whatever. But there is a Jewish targum, a commentary on this verse that talks about this tower of Eder and how the tower of Eder is just outside of Bethlehem as you go towards Jerusalem, interestingly enough. And that this tower of Eder becomes a watchtower. And what's real interesting is they tie in the Targum Micah 5.2 that tells us that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem to this passage and says the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem and according to Jewish Targum, Messiah, his arrival, will be announced at this tower of Eder. The same tower of Eder that Jacob went to after Rachel died, giving birth in Bethlehem to the son of my right hand. Just an interesting thing. Now, why is that important? Because of because Luke mentions it, which is amazing to me. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. You kept watch from the tower. We always picture the shepherds out there with the sheep. No, no, they're with the tower. They're in this tower of Eder. And while they're in the tower of Eder, remember what Jewish tradition was looking for? They were looking for the Messiah's arrival to be announced from that tower. Well, they're in that tower. And it's night. It's quiet. The stars are out. The shepherds are in the tower watching over the sheep looking for predators. And all of a sudden, behold. Remember whenever you see behold, you think of a three-letter word. What is that word? Wow. They're there and wow. Whenever you see behold, it's wow. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. They're going, what? <laughs> and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Do you realize how many hundreds of years it's been since the glory of the Lord has shone around anybody in Israel? Remember the glory of the Lord? We saw it in the wilderness wanderings when God would just show up. We saw it filling the tabernacle so much Moses couldn't go in. We saw it filling the temple, but then we saw it leaving the temple and going to the Mount of Olives and then leaving, and the glory of God was gone for hundreds and hundreds of years. And now all of a sudden out here at the tower, or the Migdal, they call it the Migdal of Eder, of the Tower of Eder, all of a sudden there's the glory of God and an angel. And they were, it doesn't even say they were afraid. It says they were greatly afraid. Literally, it's they feared a great fear. They are freaked out is what's happening. These are some rough dudes. And they are freaked out as the glory of God lights the sky with this angel. Then the angel said to them, again, we see that same phrase, don't be afraid. Feedy. Don't be afraid. Are you afraid right now? No. So I, I don't tell her not to be afraid because you're not afraid. You only tell someone not to be afraid if they're afraid. So these guys are afraid. And the first thing he says, don't be afraid. They're, going, they're freaking. 
and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said, do not be afraid for, wow, I'm bringing you good tidings of great joy which will be for all people. And we, we hear that and we read it, we read it every year. And we go, isn't that fun? Let's take a look, what does that mean? He says, don't be afraid, I'm going to bring you good tidings. Good tidings is, is one word, interestingly enough, in the original language, and it's euangelion. It's where we get the word euangelion, uh, evangel evangelize comes from that word. And it literally means good news. So he's just saying, I'm bringing you some good news. Don't freak out, I'm bringing you good news of great joy. The word great, we've talked about mega. Means great, mega. And then joy, the word for joy in the Greek is kara, C A R A, close. And whenever Luke is writing, specifically in the gospel, but also in Acts, whenever he's writing, the word joy, kara, is always, 100% of the time, associated with salvation, interestingly enough. So he says, Don't freak out, I'm bringing you good news of great joy affiliated with salvation which will be to the Jewish people. Doesn't say that, does it? To all people, aren't you glad? Oh, those Gentiles in here, we're praising God for that one right there. The word all, P-A-S in the Greek, pas. I looked it up again just to make sure it hasn't changed. Do you know what P-A-S, pas, in the Greek means in English? All. Everyone. He says, don't freak out. I'm bringing you good news of great joy associated with salvation, which will be for everybody, the whole world. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2, a Savior, wow, who is Christ, the Messiah, the Lord God. Look at that. A Savior, the Messiah, and God. That's Him. He's coming. This is what you've been waiting for all these years. I'm here to tell you, He's here. Remember, Jewish tradition said when Messiah comes, it's going to be announced from the Migdal Eber. It is. But not going that way, not going from the tower out. No, it's coming from the heavens in. That angel, it's announced right there. It actually... God is so good. He meets everybody right where we're at. It's just amazing to me. The longer you walk with the Lord, don't you see that all the time? It amazes me. Uh, you know, hermeneutics is a, uh, is a study sometimes, in, uh, num numerics, numerical hermeneutics, where you study numbers, and every letter has a numerical value, and you add up the words of this, or the number, the value, the n letter value of each word, and you can get all these different values, and you can add this one and add that one, and subtract them and divide them and find squares of them, and it's like crazy. And most of us look at that and say, whatever. Man, that is weird. That is weird stuff right there. I, I don't believe that. We don't have to. It's not for you. When I was in Santa Fe, we had so many from the lab so many engineers and scientists from the lab that were coming to Christ and they were driving down from the hill, driving into the church in Santa Fe, over a hundred of them, so much so that we did a study up on Monday nights in Los Alamos because there were so many coming down Sundays, we'll come up to you on Monday. And it was amazing. But you talk with these guys. They got into numbers. I'm here to tell you, they like numbers. They like numbers better than letters, I think. <laughs> but they were just getting blown away by the numerics in the Bible. And God was reaching them with numbers. Now most of us say, we don't care. But if you're a numbers guy, it shows again the validity of Scripture that this is not some man-written book. Because they'd come up with stuff that I don't understand. They were talking about all kinds of, oh really? Wow, that's pretty good. But they said, it's impossible. This could not just have happened. This cannot happen. This has got to have some divine origin. This just, you can't just do this. And they were running stuff on computer. They were, they were getting all excited. And I'm like, that's cool. But God can reach anybody, anywhere. We don't have to be all... Kind of bothered me a little bit because I thought I was probably the smartest thing that ever walked the planet. And then I met those guys and I go, I'm dumber than a stick. Huh? Yeah, I'm dumb, <laughs> dumb, dumb. You know, so if you're here, just, just chill and just realize you're dumber than a stick too. And God's got this, and we don't. So let's just trust Him and enjoy it, man. Just calm yourself. Just enjoy. Just enjoy what God has for you. 
And he can reach you any which way. He even reached some of these Jewish folks through their tradition off a of targum and said, you know, I'm going to put the shepherds right there on this Migdal Eber. And Angel, you go talk to those dudes right there because <coughs> society says they can't be trusted. In fact, they're not even allowed to testify in court. If you did something, you go to court, you got a witness, yeah, who? That shepherd. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. <laughs> He's not even allowed to testify. And God says, that's who I want to testify about me coming. They're unclean ceremonially. They can't go to the temple because they're, they're not even allowed to go to church. And I want them to tell people because people call them liars. I want them to be the ones to tell because God uses the unclean, rejected by the world, the victims of wagging tongues. That's who God loves to use. And he says, I'm going to use the foolish things of this world. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get the glory. And that's what God does. I love it. I love it. So if you're here today, and the world looks down on you as a has-been loser, man, are you qualified. <laughs> And if you've been to seminary, God can still use you. It's okay. <laughs> Just repent. And God can use you. Anybody here want to admit they've ever gone to Bible school or seminary? Can I see your hand? Anybody ever admit it? God can still use you. He can. He can. He can. It's all right. It's all right. But don't think you're all that because you went to a school. <laughs> really? Come on now. I've taught that for years, and people say, that's just because you've never been to it. No, I have been. I've been to seminary. Yeah, I've been there. I got my degrees. <laughs> I've repented. <laughs> now it's your turn. Don't trust in that. There's going to be a lot of people with Bible school education in hell. But there's going to be a lot of Bible school education in heaven. But it's not going to be based on them going to Bible school or seminary. It's going to be based on placing their faith in Jesus Christ. And that's it. But the more education you get, the more opportunity to serve others. Not to have people serve you, but to serve others. So, shepherds, probably temple shepherds. Because all the other sheep are out in the wilderness. Watching over their flock, for sure, by the Migdal Eber. The place where one day it was going to be professed Messiah has come. And it was professed there, but it wasn't from the people in the tower. It was to the people in the tower, interestingly enough. God even meets the tradition and the cultural expectations of the people. And this will be a sign to you. You're going to find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with that angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, a multitude of the heavenly host. I would like us to turn over into uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 5. If you were here for our Revelation study, we just finished it up a couple months ago. We spent two years in the book of Revelation. It was slow. But in there, you might remember, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, is he has this vision of being up in the throne room of God in chapter 5, verse 11. says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And we said at that time, when this was written, the largest number that could be written out was 10,000. Interestingly enough, and what does he say? 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. In other words, couldn't count them all. There were just so many innumerable, unfathomable, inconceivable. You just could not get it. You couldn't get it. So you look at this and, and he says that they, they come, there's so many of them, it says, where am I? In verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. So many, a multitude. There are just so many of them. Can you imagine? You're in the dark and you see the stars twinkle. And all of a sudden there's this angel and the glory of God. And you're freaking out. And he says, Messiah is coming. You go, oh, Messiah is coming. Are you kidding me? And then all of a sudden, angels, a multitude of them. Everywhere. 
And they're praising God, and notice they're not singing that Christmas song that we sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We should be saying, Hark the Herald Angels Say. Because something interesting in the New Testament, you never see angels singing. They're always saying. I wonder how many times they look at us and go, why aren't these humans singing? They would do anything to praise God with singing. And they're stuck saying. I don't know, this is just me talking. To, it's just me, 100% me. Ezekiel 28, remember, Lucifer's the worship leader. And I just wonder if from that moment on they could say but not sing. I don't know, I'm just wondering. But I do know we're, we can sing. But yet how many times don't we sing? The enemy gets in our ear. You don't sing, well, don't sing. You're going to sing off key. Well, duh. <laughs> of course we're going to sing off key. That's what we do. That's who we are. But we just sing. You've all heard it said, make a joyful noise. Just sing. Just sing. It's amazing how freeing it is we just sing. It's wonderful, you know. And if you want to really get free, I challenge you to do this. It, it works. Anybody here ever been to Old Town? Put them up, leave them up. See, it works. <laughs> Try singing in that position. It's amazing. Just lift your hands. It's amazing. Amen. It doesn't mean you're going to be flopping around on the floor. You can. It won't happen. But you can raise your hand. It's okay. It's the Hebrew prayer position. Just lift holy hands, the Bible says. Just do it. It's okay. Try it. It's so freeing, guys, to sing and, and raise your hands. You see, worship isn't a warm-up for the Word. No. We're worshiping the Lord. We're worshiping the Lord. Huh. Anyway, here they are, and they're praising God, and they're saying, glory to God in the highest. That literally means in the heavens. So they're saying, bring glory to God. Praise God. Here's glory to God in the heavens, and on earth, peace. Peace on the earth. The trifecta here. Holy, holy, holy. What do they say? Glory to God. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men, which is a really poor translation of what that says. Most of the Bibles that you have, if you look down at the bottom, you're going to see a little thing. You'll say 2.14. You'll say the NU text reads, toward men of goodwill, which is a much better translation. But what's interesting, well, what does that mean, towards men of goodwill? What, what is that? Well, first we look at Romans 5.1 because he says there's going to be peace on earth, guys, and that's kind of key. In Romans 5, verse 1, take a look there, this peace. Therefore, verse 1, Romans 5, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we place our faith in Jesus Christ. He sees us just as if we've never seen, sinned. It's a one-time event. We've been justified. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And way back here at the announcing of his birth, the angels come and there on this Migdal eater stand these temple shepherds, unclean as all get out. The angel says, the Messiah is coming. You're going to see him in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. And the angels all, oh, oh, there they are. And they say, glory to God in the heavens. Peace on earth. How is that? Because of Jesus. Because of this baby, there will be this inner peace. Not the outer peace, no war. True peace. And then notice what he says. And goodwill toward men. Or literally toward the men of goodwill. And even that, we, the men of goodwill. Take a look at Luke chapter 3. The next, just turn the page over from Luke 2. Jesus is getting baptized. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, in verse 21, also was baptized. And while Jesus prayed, the heaven was opened. Here we go again. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon Jesus. And a voice came from heaven which says, you're my beloved son. And the exact same words afterward. In you I am well pleased. That's exactly the same words that we have in the New King James goodwill toward men. It's basically I'm pleased with you. So what is it saying? Glory to God in the highest on earth will come peace and God will be pleased with you. How do we have the favor of God? How do we find the perfect will of God? 
we find that peace that passes all understanding, that peace that comes from placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the announcement of the angels here. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste. I'm not going to say anything about the Christmas rush. I'm not going to say it. And they came with haste and they found Mary. That word found is finding after much searching. So these shepherds are all over Bethlehem and you imagine in the middle of the night looking for a baby in a manger. Have you seen a baby in a cow trough anywhere? That's, that's the question. Can you imagine? And they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. There he is. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. What was that saying? We just talked about it. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, and goodwill toward men. There's, they were told that. So now they're telling people, hey, they just told us Messiah is coming and this is what's going to happen. They're, they're going. What, why did they do that? Because they saw Jesus. That is the natural response of someone truly seeing Jesus. If we see a church, we'll invite people to church. If we see Jesus, we'll invite people to Jesus. If we're in love with our pastor, we'll tell people to come hear our pastor. But if we're in love with Jesus... We'll tell them about Jesus. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which they were told by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Can you imagine this young girl? She goes, wow, what a rush this year's been. <laughs> I'm pregnant, Joseph. You don't have to believe me on this one. I'm going to pray about that. He comes when I believe you. Tongues are wagging. Here she is. Then the edict comes. Babe, we got to go to Bethlehem. She goes, whoa, Micah 5 too. The angel told me this is the... Mis oh, Joseph, you don't think. We're going. Let's go, babe. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? So now they are all by herself and here comes this baby. She has to swaddle the baby. She places the baby, the only place she had was in a, a, a trough. And all of a sudden these shepherds come in. They say, we were at the Migdal Eater. They know that they're Jews. They know all about the, that's where the announcement of Messiah is going to come. And these angels appeared to us and said, we'll find the Messiah right here. She's going, hmm. God's in control, man. You better know she knows it. Caesar Augustus says, we gots to go. He has no choice because God is the one that put that thought into his little pea brain. And I know he had a pea brain because he's a human. None of us have a mind like God. No one. God says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. Our God is so much greater than us. We just got to calm ourselves and trust God, you know? But there's Mary. She's looking at all this going, oh, my word, God is real. You ever had that moment where you just stop and ponder the ways of God because you see his word and his prayer being answered and you go, no way. You ever had that? And you ponder that? Isn't that sweet? Yes. It's better than going to church. Anybody can go to church. But if you really know Jesus and he speaks to you directly and you see him fulfill his promise to you directly against all odds and people are saying, okay, and it's, but it's, it happens and you go, it's real. It's amazing what that does. Amen. It's amazing what that does. And you can't help but ponder. When we go to Israel, it happens to me almost every trip. We call it that moment. It's that pondering time where there you are and all of a sudden it's very real. And you read about it, and you study about it, you see pictures of it, but then all of a sudden, you breathe it. And you see it. And you go, oh my word, this is real. And it's real. And it's amazing. It's amazing. Mary pondered all this in her heart. 
God spoke about the coming of the Messiah at the Migdal Eber, Joseph. Can you believe it? He did. He said to me things. They said it was going to... It happened. And we're in Bethel. And look at Micah 5.2. It says it right. I'm reading it right now. This is crazy, Mary. You ever had that with your wife, guys? You lay in bed and something crazy is going on. And you just go, can you believe this? I can't believe it. Oh, my goodness. Are you sleeping yet? Not yet. I can't sleep. Me? Yeah, I bet they didn't sleep for five months. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine? Amazing. Left all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned. Where did they return? You know where they went back to doing? Watching them sheep. You know why they did that? That was their job. They saw Jesus for real. They had a personal encounter with Jesus and then they went back to work. But what did they do? They glorified and praised God just like the angels were doing. Remember? Glory to God in the highest. They were praising God. Now they're doing it. The angel sets a template. This is what you do. Now go back to work and do that. That's what Christians do. Wherever we are, we glorify and praise God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. Snap Christmas stories. Fun, isn't it? You can just read that all, every year. We should do that every year. Just read the Christmas story. But I trust that maybe God shed a little bit of light in one area of the story that I never heard that before. I'll check it out. See if it's true. I made up most of that stuff. So you no, I'm just playing. Anyway. <laughs> but check it out. It's some sweet stuff, isn't it? It's just sweet. So we leave here Christmas season remembering a couple things. God is in control. He places leaders. He takes down leaders. Whatever. That does not affect our relationship with Jesus, and by all means, it does not reflect our relationship or affect our relationship with each other. We're going to love each other because that's what God tells us to do. And um, we joke about football with the Cowboys and the, and the uh, Saints. Are they, they, they still have a team, don't they, the Broncos? Yeah, the Broncos. <laughs> There we are. You see, we got all that? But we laugh and we joke and we still love each other. Sharon's a Packer fan, but it's okay. I'm still going to love her. It's just what it is. We should be loving each other even though we differ. We, are, we, differ, we have differences in our political views. Someone came up to me. I didn't come up to me. I was having, I was eating with them. They said, well, you're a Democrat. I'm not a Democrat. Sorry. Then someone said, well, you're a Republican. I'm not a Republican. <laughs> Sorry. I'm an independent. You know what that means? I don't have to vote in any of the primaries. <laughs> nice. <laughs> But I don't identify with the political party. Yeah. I identify with Jesus. Yeah. 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 That's it. And if you're here in a Republican, I'm going to love you. If you're in a Democrat, I'm going to love you. If you're independent, I'm going to love you. I don't care what you are. I could, I could not care any less. I don't <laughs> care. But I do care that you know Jesus. And I do care that you're walking with him. And I do care that you're loving one another. That's what we're called to do. So just love one another, guys. Just love one another. Don't get up, caught up right now. There's, a, there's such a strong environment of hatred right now in our country. And it shouldn't be. Connie and I um, spent about an hour with a good friend of mine. He's a uh, Eastern Orthodox priest up in Santa Fe, born again, not an evangelical. We hadn't seen each other in 25 years. And Connie and I are driving, and I see this Eastern Orthodox chair. I go, babe, I wonder if that's Ben Court's, because he was going to start one. I wonder if that's his. So we just pulled in there and 
There it was, Father John Betancourt on the door, you know, little phone number, it's all locked. Cars are there, but it's locked. So I just dialed the number and say, his name's Ralph. He, he changed his name when he became a priest of Father John. I can't call him Father John. I says, Ralph. I say, hey, Ralph, this is Con. I said, I haven't talked to you forever, man. We're in town, and I'm just going to stop and say hi. Um, here's my number, call me. About an hour later, we get this message. So, oh, man, I'm leaving town in about an hour. Can you guys come to the church quick? I hustle over there and hung out with him for an hour. It was so fun. So fun. Eastern Orthodoxy, they do not see themselves as evangelicals. They're Eastern Orthodox. Uh, these are the ones that came up with the Council of Nicaea and came up with the Council of Chalcedon. And their, their doctrine is spot on in so many areas. And of course, we, there's always that issue of the veneration of icons and all that goes with that one. He was an Episcopalian priest when I knew him. And uh, he was thinking of either becoming a Calvary Chapel pastor or an Eastern Orthodox priest. He wasn't sure which way he was going to go. He went for the priest. And he knew I'd go to Bulgaria a lot. And I told him back then, I said, I'm going to be going to Istanbul this trip. He said, oh, man, pick up an icon for me. I said, an icon? I said, no, 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 you, Ralph, icon. But I didn't say it. But so he, <laughs> sorry, sorry. But so I, I did, I did get a... I did get a, sorry. I did pick up an icon for him. He was so excited about that icon and all. But at any rate, he said, I can't believe you called me, Khan. This is crazy. About six months ago, I, whatever happened to Khan? I just, where, where did he end up, I wonder? So he Googled our name and got to our website, and he went on to the um, teaching section, and he just kind of scrolled around, and he just picked one. Boom. I don't know which one he picked. But he said, I started listening to it. He goes, yeah, that's him. That's how he used to teach, because he used to take my tapes and listen to my tapes a lot, I know. And that's him. He's still teaching the same way. That's great. He's just listening. And of all those teachings that we have on there, he picked the one where he's listening. And I said, I had this friend. He was debating if he should go into Eastern Orthodoxy or into Calvary Chapel. He decided to go to Eastern Orthodoxy. He wanted me to get an icon, so I went and got an icon, and I was sitting in my favorite restaurant at that time, Tecolote, out there on Cerios, having breakfast, and in he walks with his Eastern Orthodox garb on, and he walked in, and I was wearing my Calvary Chapel outfit. I had shorts and a muscle shirt and long hair. And, and he walks in, and I see him, and I go, Ralph, and he's with a couple Eastern Orthodox guys, and he goes, come on, and we jump up, and we bear hug each other. This is 25 years, 22 years ago. And we just bear hug one another. And we're laughing and talking and it's good to see him. And I said, I got the icon for you. Oh, that'd yeah, be great. Talk, talk. Well, I taught about that. And of all the teachings that we have online, how many do we have online? A bunch. He got that one. <laughs> and he said, then you start talking about Eastern Orthodoxy. So it might have been the church history one. I don't know how he got it, but... He says, and then you start teaching about Eastern Orthodoxy. He says, and evangelicals, they don't understand. Either. But you were teaching it right. How did you teach it right? And I said, well, I'm a church history guy. Yeah, it was right. And he was so excited. And it, we just had the most wonderful time. He had, we sat and had tea together. And I gave him my testimony from the time I left Santa Fe up until now. And talked about the kids. And we just had a blast. And I said, Ralph. He just smiles. I, I can't call him. And my Bible says, call no man father. I can't do it. I'm sorry. So I said, Ralph, I said, would you ever come to Santa Fe and just teach? Or, uh, thank you, Albuquerque and teach? And he says, in your pulpit? I said, yeah, it'd be great. I would love to. And I said, I'll have you come out on a Thursday night sometime, I'll announce it, and just tell us about your testimony in Eastern Orthodoxy a little bit, but just tell us about you. So it's coming. And when he comes, if you come here and you see this priest up here with his big beard, outfit, little hat on, just, oh, you must be Ralph. And that'll be great. And uh, he's awesome. He's a wonderful, wonderful dude. And he'll be here one Thursday night. And if you don't come Thursday night, you're going to miss a uh, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So just come every Thursday. I won't tell you in advance. <laughs> but it'll be good. It'll be good. But um, that's what we got. I don't even know where that came from, but at any rate, it's cool. So, God uses whoever. Bottom line is we're just going to love one another, and we can even love an Eastern Orthodox priest. Because he's going to be in heaven one day. 
He knows Jesus for sure, for sure. There are Roman Catholic priests that know the Lord. I met some Baptists that know the Lord. I have. I've met some Baptists that know the Lord. I've met people at Calvary Chapel, and some of them know Jesus. And our prayer is that at least two or three of us in this room will know the Lord too. Just because you come here doesn't mean you know the Lord. It's a personal decision to follow Christ. And that's what we're going to be doing on Tuesday night, is giving people an opportunity just to talk about Jesus. We don't have to lead them to Christ. We're just going to love them and tell them about Jesus. And the Spirit of God will reel them in. So we're just going to tell them about Jesus. Don't miss out on this opportunity just for nostalgia. Don't do it. Get your opportunity to tell people of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time just to hang out and worship you, praise you, remember who you are, rejoice in the fact of the incarnation that God, you came down and took on this flesh to die for us that we might have eternal life. God, we thank you for that. We ask you bless us during this season. The many that are traveling, God, we pray for safe travels. God, that this would be a time of the season when you are truly, truly glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.